We have a very distinguished speaker, Professor Hudson Janish from the University of Toronto, who's well known, I think, probably to everyone in the room as an expert in the uh, area of administrative law. Uh, the commentators who will, who will uh, comment on Professor Janish's paper, and he will speak for a half, half an hour, are um, on my extreme left, Mr. Jim Bailey, who's a partner at the law firm of Tory & Tory. Uh, I think it's fair to say he's the dean in the uh, corporate securities bar and a past chairman of the Ontario Securities Commission. <coughs> on my um, immediate left is Anna Fraser, uh, who was until recently a member of the Ontario Municipal Board and uh, before that was uh, a practitioner at the uh, law firm of Goodman and Carr. <coughs> Professor Janish on my right and uh, on my extreme right is Beth Symes, who's the uh, chair of the Pay Equity Hearings Tribunal. With Professor Janish. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. What I uh, have done is to put together quite a lengthy paper. Uh, a lengthy, unfootnoted paper, I should acknowledge, uh, that is in your, uh, your, uh, your materials. Uh, the reason why it's in unfootnoted is the uh, determination I had uh, that uh, the commentators would have a decent period of time to have a look at it. And I must say, personally, I'm, I'm quite delighted uh, when you hear their, their comments, how much thought and care uh, they've given to the, uh, to the, to the subject. So I, I'm, I'm very pleased that I, I moved uh, more quickly than I might, uh, might otherwise to get it out. Although, uh, as perhaps you, you know, uh, the notion of heavily footnoted uh, law review articles is uh, coming under some uh, contemporary criticism. And uh, the neatest uh, uh, critique of the use of footnotes that I saw recently uh, was, in fact, by uh, Noel Coward. Uh, Noel Coward said that to, to read a footnote is like uh, to uh, be making love upstairs and to go downstairs to answer the doorbell which I, I think is, is, is rather nice. Although a, a colleague of mine said that he didn't understand what Noel Coward knew about making love upstairs anyway, but uh, that's, uh, that's neither, neither, neither here nor there. Uh, I also would say that in, in addition to, to benefiting from the uh, comments of the commentators uh, that you'll be hearing um, uh, later this morning, uh, I greatly benefited from a, a very interesting critique from my good friend uh, John Evans, uh, and uh, I certainly hope to incorporate uh, some of these ideas uh, into the uh, final version of the, uh, of the paper. Now, the starting point, it seems to me, for our discussion this morning is that one of the most distinctive aspects uh, of the administrative process is the flexibility that it affords in the selection of methods of decision making. While a legislature must normally confine itself to a declaration of generally applicable standards of conduct, and a court must deal with a problem as defined by the particular controversy before it, an administrative agency may often choose between these approaches or may even reject them in favor of a more informal means of, of decision making. So that, that what I want to, to make sure that we're thinking about is this question of choice, that administrative agencies have a significant degree of choice in the way they set about their, uh, their, their task. And I propose uh, this morning to develop the thesis that in that process of choice, we place too much emphasis on adjudication and not enough on the development of policies and on, on rulemaking. And I will argue that rulemaking remains singularly undeveloped as an idea and a practice in Canadian administrative law, while policies were resorted to are not always reconcilable uh, with the grant of, uh, of, of legal, uh, le legal authority. So that's, it's the question of choice and the range of choice and how we set about uh, making those, uh, those choices. Now, I was very struck in, in, in preparing my thoughts today by a very powerful um, affirmation of the importance of rulemaking uh, in the Cornish report, that is the June 1992 report of the Ontario Human Rights Code uh, Review uh, Task Force. And I was also reminded that uh, one of the major studies in this area, the 1985 uh, um, uh, Law Reform Commission uh, study, um, uh, report on independent administrative agencies, had also pushed very hard for a shift to rulemaking. 
And I, I've quoted what seems to me to be a very powerful starting point for our discussion uh, 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 idea uh, from the, uh, from the uh, Cornish report uh, in the paper. And, and that report says that with respect to the Ontario Human Rights Commission, that it has become little more than a claim processing unit and that commission energy and resources have been dissipated in an endless task of trying to keep up with the volume of claims. And I have a quote which I think is worth uh, uh, having as a background text for our discussion this morning. That the Ontario Human Rights Commission's role has been reactive, says the Cornish report, not proactive, and geared to individual cases of discrimination, not systemic discrimination placing almost all its resources in pursuing individual claims and leaving out a broad strategic approach is costly, time consuming, and unlikely to bring about positive results. Even if an individual claim is successful, says the report, it usually changes the circumstances of the individual only and makes little difference in overcoming widespread systemic discrimination in society. And the Cornish report then goes on to, to, to adopt uh, essentially the American rulemaking approach to uh, issues of, uh, of, uh, of discrimination and, 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 and argues very strongly that by excessive reliance on adjudication, one has uh, dissipated one's resources and failed to address uh, the problems of discrimination uh, within in, in society. And I want to return again to the Cornish report because it, it raises some very important legitimacy issues for me on this issue of rulemaking in just a moment. And in 1985, as I set out in the paper, the, uh, the former, uh, the late uh, Law Reform Commission, a Federal Law Reform Commission, um, uh, e emphasized very strongly that a weakness in the uh, activities of the agency, the Ottawa agencies at least, was in a failure to take more initiatives in, in the in notion of, of generalization and of, and of uh, rulemaking and of, uh, and, of, uh, and, and of policies. Now, if we're talking about choice, we have to again have some notion of, of what, what sort of choice it is that we are, we, we are making. And I think again, for the purposes of background, I, I wish to, to mention at least uh, some uh, sort of functional um, uh, 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 definitions. The, the essence, it seems to me, of a rule as opposed to an adjudication is that the former, that is the rule, lays down a norm of conduct of general application while uh, the adjudication deals only with the immediate parties to a particular dispute. And one has to concede immediately that some rules may only affect a very limited class of persons uh, whilst in a regime of precedent, an adjudication may in effect uh, a very large range of persons. So that you, you have to keep that, that, uh, that, uh, that tension in mind. But I think it's still worth emphasizing that a rule is an agency statement of general applicability and future effect. And I, and I emphasize the future effect, and again, I, I'll come back to that. That a rule is binding on all those it addresses, including the agency itself. It may be possible, however, to waive a rule under some circumstances. It may be possible, however, uh, absent waiver, uh, a rule is a law that is directly binding on all those within its terms, whether or not they participated in the rulemaking proceedings leading to its uh, 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 origination. Adjudication, as we all know, leads to a particular application determining the rights of specific parties on the basis of the special circumstances involved. Adjudication allows for ad hoc adoption of principles of law that are necessary to solve specific cases, but again, they may serve as precedent for future cases. And I say, strictly speaking, any order that flows from an adjudication is not directly binding on any persons other than the parties in the particular, particular cases. Now, I think one of the issues and one of the problems that I see in Canadian administrative law is that we have tended to compartmentalize our thinking in the question of choice to adjudication on the one hand and formal regulations on the other. Now we all know formal regulations made under the, the, uh, uh, the appropriate legislation, the Regulations Act, 
uh, are obviously rules of general applicability. And they are binding and, and so forth. So they clearly fill uh, the, the definition of a, of a rule. But I think the, the problem is that by, by, by dividing our thinking in that fashion, what we miss, in fact, is that there is a significant area that is no longer simply uh, iterative uh, adjudications, but is an area in which policy is being formed, which is not formally binding, but which may in, ta in time become binding, and that we are moving then towards a more definitive uh, uh, a resolution to issues which in turn will become, uh, become, uh, become rules. And I think the, the important thing to, to recognize, uh, because the terminology rulemaking uh, is uh, uh, largely drawn from uh, American administrative law, is that one has to bear in mind that, that rules aren't anything different from what administrative agencies are in fact already doing. That is, administrative agencies are seeking to generalize, and they are seeking to, to deal with issues uh, on a, a basis which is future-oriented, uh, and that and that, that rulemaking uh, process is going on, in fact, uh, all the time. And, and I'm reminded uh, of the uh, uh, the uh, the person who the story of the person who desperately wanted uh, to to be a poet, and for years and years he, he sought to write poetry, uh, but was greatly mollified in, in in old age to be told that in any event he wrote prose. And, and he thought that was absolutely wonderful. And, and I think it's the same thing that we have here with respect to rules. In other words. Rules are not unique. They are, in fact, what we are constantly in the process of, of, of doing. And that what's needed, it seems to me, is to identify them and then to realize uh, what the uh, legal issues that they raise. Now, in the, in the paper, I develop a whole series of arguments uh, that have been used uh, with respect to the benefits of, uh, of, of rulemaking. Rulemaking is uh, very extensively employed in, uh, in the United States. And uh, my mentor at the University of Chicago, Casey Davis, um, in 1976 uh, was uh, uh, able to uh, proclaim uh, that the United States is entering the age of rulemaking. And he said, the rest of the world in governments of all kinds is likely to follow. The main tool of getting governmental jobs done will be rulemaking authorized by legislative bodies and checked by courts. And in fact, if you look at the list on page 12 of my, my paper uh, of the claimed virtues of, uh, of rules and of rulemaking, uh, it's, it's quite an, Im an impressive list. Um, it, clearly, uh, this is not the opportunity to, to work my way through that list, but I would like to call your attention to uh, A and B, public participation and legitimacy, and then to the bottom of the list to J and K, consistency and prospective application. Rulemaking, if one once acknowledges that this is what one is really doing, can lead to a very effective opportunity for interested groups to participate in the process. That, that once one is conscious that one is trying to generalize and not fritter away resources in endless adjudication, then one can hold rulemaking hearings. And these are very uh, uh, greatly developed in, uh, in the uh, American uh, administrative law. And so that public participation is seen as a very positive advantage of rulemaking. Uh, and it gives a much better opportunity. I, I, for years, have done work for the Consumers Association. And, and there was a real frustration there that one went and to before tribunals and argued individual cases. Whereas what one really wanted to do was to change the, the, the format and to have an opportunity to talk about the changed rules and approaches to problems, and that a rulemaking uh, hearing does provide for that opportunity. The second issue in my list, and again, I, I emphasize in the paper a very American concept of legitimacy, is that an administrative agency which has gone through a public participation process in rulemaking development can claim greater legitimacy for its, uh, its, uh, its, its, uh, its, its activities. Now, this issue of legitimacy has come up, I believe, very seriously in the Cornish report proposals. And again, I propose to return to that at the end of, the, uh, end of my, my talk this morning. And, and J and K, I think, are very worthwhile to think about. 
prospective application is always a claimed virtue for a legislative rather than an adjudicative activity. That is that, that there, is, there is great difficulty in changing decisions on the basis of individual cases because parties naturally enough will say, well, I operated under the rules as they were at the time or as I was advised they were. How come now in an adjudication you are seeking to change the direction in which you, uh, you have been going? So prospective application, I think, is a substantial virtue in rulemaking and one which I think we should not lose sight of. And finally, consistency does seem to me to be a very important value uh, in the law. Uh, we are going to hear from the commentators, I'm sure, uh, some emphasis on the desirability that administrative tribunals deal with individual cases on the basis of the individual arguments and concerns that are raised. But there is great need for consistency. And I don't think our administrative tribunals uh, have a good reputation for dealing with issues in a consistent manner. And rulemaking can make uh, uh, greater opportunities for, uh, for, uh, for consistency. Now, as I say, I don't have time to develop all the arguments. But for the sake of argument, perhaps ac accept my notion that there are, there's great virtue to, uh, to rulemaking. One then has to ask oneself, why is there so relatively little enthusiasm for rulemaking in Canada. And here I think it's interesting to note that although the uh, Law Reform Commission of Canada in 1985 uh, emphasized very strongly the virtues of rulemaking, they also recognized that in practice many federal administrative agencies were resistant to the idea. As the uh, Law Reform Commission conceded in 1985, we sense a strong bias towards the case-by-case -case exercise of discretion. Most agencies as yet display only a cautious willingness to structure discretion and then only informally through non-binding statements. So, so therefore, in the, what I've done in the paper is to suggest great enthusiasm for the benefits of rules in the United States and, and, a, and relatively little enthusiasm in Canada. And I then explore uh, why it is that there is this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this difference. And again, um, I have listed, uh, and then you can see them on page, uh, page 35, uh, a number of, of uh, uh, propositions uh, as to uh, why I think uh, there is this uh, little, uh, little enthusiasm. And I would like to, to work my way very briefly uh, through those, uh, through those uh, points. First of all, uh, there is the reality of what I call bureaucratic inertia. And, and I'm not, in that, I'm not being, being anti-bureaucratic. I'm just saying that there's a reality that if you are faced with great pressures to decide large numbers of cases, that there is an overwhelming a tendency to deal with those cases as quickly as you can on a case-by-case -case basis to get them out of the way, rather than to stop and think about how you should be applying your discretion in future cases. And, and one of the ways I sometimes tease my students about that, I say, well, if at the end of the week somebody asks you, what have you done this week? And you say, I've decided 14 cases. People will say, wow, that's a hard work, work week. If somebody asked you, what have you done this week? And you said, well, I've sat and thought about how I should deal with 150 cases that are coming up. People will say, well, that's not very impressive. I mean, you could almost be at the faculty of law if you're just sitting and thinking. Uh, you're not doing anything. So a perception of activity is terribly important. And getting cases out the door is a, is, is a very strong activity. So it requires some really sort of tough-mindedness to say, no, I'm not going to plunge into mindless adjudication. I'm not going to dissipate my resources, as the Cornish uh, report said of the Human Rights Commission. I'm going to stop, and I'm going to try and draw up some systematic rules in this area, rather than just uh, adjudicating uh, uh, quite crazily. And, and I think that's a, a, an, important, an important matter. Second is the question of lawyers' values. Well, to the extent that rulemaking, the claimed benefits of rulemaking include participation and consistency, one might have thought that lawyers' values would very strongly favor rulemaking. However, the more I thought about this, the more I realized that lawyers' values really are private lawyers' values rather than public lawyers' values. And most lawyers dealing with the administrative system and dealing with administrative agencies are dealing with particular cases for particular clients. And what they want is an exercise of discretion in the favor of their client in each individual case. And they aren't interested in more general rules, which they would run into and say, I'm sorry to the client, I can't do anything, there's a general rule here. 
they, 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 uh, that, that, that individual laws. Now, my argument would be here that unfortunately, private lawyers' values have predominated in legal values because it seems to me that there are very legitimate public law values of creating coherence and consistency in decision making which should really encourage a greater use of, of rulemaking. But, but I do understand, uh, understand why when the individual lawyer is asked about rulemaking, he would say, no, no, give me discretion because I can always argue my client's case in favor of the, of the exercise of discretion rather than favoring a broader understanding of how a system works, which in the benefits of the overall operation of the system might require a, a degree of, uh, of, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of rulemaking. I think there's a real problem that we have not yet established, uh, understandable consultation mechanisms in rulemaking. So there is resistance, and, and, and again, one can, one can uh, see this in various places, to the notion of shifting to rule. If I have an adjudication, I can look at the adjudicator and argue my case. And I think, wow, I'm really managing to, to make some progress here. Whereas if it's a rule, you feel some, some bureaucratic body has made the rule and I have no control over it. So you have to recognize that any shift to rulemaking has to make sure that there are more, more adequate opportunities than there are now for, uh, for uh, a consultation uh, mechanism. Then I think there's a very real problem, again, which, which I think is demonstrated by our putting our categorization of, of uh, adjudication or regulations in the notion of the interplay between discretion and rules. I mean, I, I would argue very strongly that the way, the way administrative agencies actually make their decisions is to be seen as on a, on a spectrum. That is, it's not, it's not, there are no, no categories that you can put them in, that there are occasions when a general rule emerges and that general rule is applied in individual, individual cases. There are other uh, situations where, especially when a new matter arises, where you really want to use the benefits of the flexibility of, uh, of adjudication. And a greater understanding of that interplay between discretion and rules, I think, is what uh, holds us back and results in our, us uh, not being as enthusiastic as I believe we should be in favor of a greater reliance on, on rulemaking. Then there is the traditional administrative law, fear of fettering. Now, I've developed the law in the paper because I believe that there isn't, in fact, to, in this day and age, uh, any real uh, concern, uh, concern here. But, but it still is something that, uh, that, that does uh, indicate. If, if, if the legislature gave us an open-ended discretion, surely we must just go on using it in a discretionary matter in individual cases. If we did have a rule, we would be uh, uh, subject to judicial review on the grounds of fettering. And I, I analyzed the case law here, and I said that in practice it doesn't uh, uh, cause as much of a problem as I think some, some think it is. Then there is, and I think this is going to play a large role uh, in the comments you're about to hear on, on my ideas, uh, of a genuine, and I, and I emphasize it for me anyway, a genuine commitment to individualized justice. That is, is a very strong feeling here that we don't want bureaucratic rules, that we really want to make sure that we individuate uh, justice, that we deal with the issues of particular people, and that we don't. My, uh, my argument, uh, in perhaps in anticipation and certainly uh, in response uh, eventually, will be that, that there is a danger if you place too much emphasis on individualized justice that you lose sight of the justice of consistency and treating like cases in similar fashion. In other words, you can place too much emphasis on the individual case, and although that it gives an appearance of being very fair, it's not necessarily fair because, in fact, it leads, uh, can often lead to a great deal of, uh, of, uh, of uh, inconsistency. Then there is the point, thank you, that I think is central and, and that I, I've struggled with in the paper, and that is the question of, of legitimacy of rulemaking by, by agencies. The Cornish report came up with a rather startling proposal. They said that because government is often involved as a respondent in human rights matters, that government shouldn't be involved in drawing up the rules that they say should replace the highly individualized adjudication in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in human rights. And it seems to me that that is an immense challenge to our understanding of legitimacy in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in our government. If you go back through any of the studies of the administrative process, they have always emphasized that general policies contained in formal regulations must always be made by a politically responsible body. 
And the idea of giving the independent uh, uh, agency the power to, uh, to make, uh, make, uh, make rules does raise this, uh, this legitimacy problem. Incidentally, I, I was very struck, uh, David Lepofsky, in a very interesting submission to the Cornish report, in fact, came up with a very elegant way of reconciling what uh, seemed to be the, the irreconcilable. That is, he said, fine, allow the Human Rights Commission to draft up rules to apply so it can deal with systemic uh, discrimination, but still leave it so that the cabinet has to approve them. So that retains the notion of political accountability, but by having an expert, credible body uh, and, and having an open public consultation mechanism, uh, this is likely to push the cabinet in the position where they're not going to turn down uh, sensible uh, uh, regulations uh, and, and that this would in fact reconcile uh, the two, uh, two, uh, two concerns. And finally, uh, in regard to the little enthusiasm for agency rulemaking, uh, there is the notion which, which I think is, is very neatly c uh, capsulized in, in the concept of the politics of purposeful ambiguity. And, 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 and this, I think, I mean, we know that, that what politicians want to do is to express a concern about a problem, but not necessarily a resolution of the problem. And in fact, that wide grants of discretion are granted on the understanding that they will never be turned into politically embarrassing rules, that they will always be used on a highly individualized basis. And this notion of the politics of purposeful ambiguity is one that I think one could, uh, could, uh, could uh, um, uh, be thinking about a, a good, deal, good deal more. Let me conclude by linking back to Margot Priest's very excellent presentation um, yesterday. You, you will recall that, uh, that Margot Priest, uh, in her uh, description of the uh, tribunal from hell, uh, was in effect uh, acting a little bit as, uh, as Roger, Roger Dangerfield. Uh, why don't we get the respect we deserve? Why, why, why is everybody beating up on us? Why don't we get the respect we, uh, we, we deserve? And it seems to me that the problem remains one of legitimacy. That is that administrative agencies are still sort of add-ons to parliamentary government. They're still referred to sometimes as structural heretics. They don't fit into the hierarchy of, uh, of, uh, of responsibility. And so that, 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 that when I was uh, both talking before and, and listening to, uh, to Margot Priest's uh, uh, presentation yesterday, it seemed to me that, it was it, that, that the same problem is going to arise on the question of rulemaking by administrative agencies. That is, if administrative agencies go forward in rulemaking, they, the question is going to arise, and I think legitimately arise, well, what authority do you have in a parliamentary system of government to undertake this, uh, this uh, rulemaking? And it does seem to me, and I end the paper, as I will uh, in my presentation this morning, with a plea for us to start thinking about how administrative agencies, and in, from my, from in, in the purposes of this presentation, administrative agencies involved in rulemaking, how they fit into our traditional notions uh, of government. And that, I think, is going to be a, a considerable matter of uh, considerable importance to us uh, down the road. And I thank you very much for your kind attention. And he was on time to the very minute. <laughs> Full Anna's well, one notice that. that. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'll ask Jim Bailey to give the first uh, comment. Dennis, this is the second time that I've had the uh, I've had the privilege of of uh, sitting before this audience, i.e., the special lectures, and with the role of commentator on one of Hudson Janish's papers. And uh, it's a it's an interesting and uh, and stimulating uh, and a role to have because Hudson's papers are invariably sufficiently discursive and yet sufficiently perceptive that they give the commentator an opportunity to say whatever he or she wants about almost anything. Uh, and so when I was wondering what to say, what to say this morning, it occurred to me that that it would be uh, regrettable if this was re regrettable for my in, in in my personal terms if. Uh, if this were to be the last time that I had the privilege of commenting on one of Hudson's papers. So then I said, well, what will the next paper be? And, and I am going to take the, the time that Dennis has allotted to me to outline for Hudson what I think his next paper should be. And then if he'd like to write it, I'd be happy to comment on it. <laughs> and and the, the next paper that I'd like to see Hudson write 
would be a paper of guidelines for chairpersons, I hate that word, but it's dictated to us these days, chair, I hate chairs even worse, so chairpersons of, of Ontario's uh, administrative tribunals. And that, that book, and, I, and I, Hudson, I hate to tell you, but I'm afraid that I'm, I'm outlining for you what may be closer to a book than, on, than an article, but I, I, I am sure that that'll just mean two days instead of one of your, of your concentrated efforts. Uh, that the, the book will be the basis for SOAR's work, Margo, uh, and, uh, and I'm sure it will be an extremely valuable contribution to the efforts. And before I come to the section of the book that will deal with rulemaking as against adjudication, let me just allude to some of the other sections that I, that I look forward to reading in, in, in about in the book. One would be the, the whole Cons question of how the of how the administrative tribunal relates to government, very difficult area. Uh, Margot uh, outlined some of the some of the interesting issues. There's a a good part of administrative law is is stuff that you never see in the cases, doesn't come up in the cases. It's the interaction with the minister, interaction with the deputy. How does the system work? What is the real balance of power? Lawyers working before the tribunals have to be aware of these things because in sensitive matters they have to know what the decision-making process is. I think Hudson would be the, a good person to outline this, put it on paper and, and have, have some information for prospective chairpersons or chairpersons to, to look at that, that tells a little bit about how, these, how the system really works and, and, uh, and what it is. Uh, my personal philosophy is that is that in the area of the making of policy? I felt this when I when I was myself a chairperson. That in the area of the making of policy, formulating rules, it is perfectly legitimate for the tribunal to listen to to input from government, not necessarily to, not to rubber stamp it, because gov because it's the tribunal's responsibility. But it is appropriate to accept governmental input and di dialogue with government. Whereas in the area of adjudication, it's not. And in fact, any interference from government is, is deeply to be resented and is, is a basis for resignation. Uh, and that is a fundamental difference between rulemaking and adjudication, which, um, which hasn't received much emphasis here, but, I, but, I, but merits mention in the context of how the, how the tribunal relates to government. How does it relate to staff? In my, in my comments uh, that are before you, I, make, I allude to that question. It seems to me a very sensitive and important question. The tribunal members are the ones who, who bear political responsibility for what it does. The staff members typically are, are able, aggressive people who want to have and should have an impact on what the policies are that emerge. How does the chairperson reconcile those conflicting considerations? How does the tribunal relate to the public? How does it educate the public about its mission, about what it's doing? How does it reconcile the, 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 the media orientation of a communications uh, focused society with the, um, with the aloof attitude that should characterize uh, bodies that are given power. And judges typically do not engage in a media exercise, do not issue news releases to defend their decisions in the face of attack. Should a tribunal take that approach? Should a tribunal issue news releases? That whole area is, reflects some difficult judgments for, for the chairperson and can have a significant impact on what the public and the legal profession perceive to be the policies and approaches of the, of the, of the group. The, those background things all color the, uh, uh, the basic decision that, that, uh, that I hope would take a very solid chapter in Hudson's book on the selection between, between adjudication, rulemaking, the real, the, the, which is I think an important but not the only aspect of the chairperson's decisions about how the tribunal will operate. And here I hope Hudson will suggest to the new chairperson or to the chairperson that that be a carefully reasoned decision, not made once and for all, but made continually as experience is gained and as new issues arise. And as issues are identified, the, chair, the, the chairperson in consultation with the full tribunal should work out what is the best technique for this particular issue. Now, at the, at the front end, it's necessary, of course, to determine what the tribunal's powers are. As has been pointed out in, in, um, in, in both in Hudson's paper and in some of the, uh, in the comments of the commentators who follow me, the, the laws differ significantly from tribunal to tribunal as to what they can do on paper. But let me assure you 
that whatever the law says, there is some flexibility available for the uh, tribunal to decide what way to go. The law doesn't, speak, doesn't address speeches. The chairperson of a tribunal typically is invited to uh, attend meetings of interested audience and make speeches. Those speeches are listened to. They're read, they're studied, and they guide, they influence conduct of the people who appear before the tribunal. Uh, another, another kind of, um, of conduct, uh, well, I mean, there's a, there's a range of, of, of things uh, available. In, in the adjudicative process, comments can be made which are very similar to rulemaking. We think this particular kind of conduct is bad, and the uh, people following the forum, even, even in the context of a tribunal which can't formally make rules, can read in the adjudication guidance that they, if they're careful and trying to predict behavior and, 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 and advise their clients as to, the, as to what the utility of taking a matter to a hearing, uh, they can divine from the adjudication, if it's worded properly, worded to this effect, they can divine some, some very wide-ranging rules. So it is necessary to determine what the law allows the tribunal to do, but that should be approached in an imaginative way. Then how do we, this, our particular tribunal, operate? Well, what is the nature of the issues? Are they issues that affect a wide-ranging constituency? Or are they issues that are very narrow and focused and affect only a, a small audience? Perhaps in an important way, some of the CRTC's decisions, for example, affect a huge constituency, affect all of us, but the specific parties, the companies that are involved, can be sometimes uh, numbered on the fingers of one hand, and that may tilt you to a little bit towards adjudication rather than rulemaking because uh, because you can focus on that audience more, more effectively. The tribunals which, which are, whose decisions directly impact a large number of people may be more tilted towards adjudication. So you have to look at the issues, look at the nature of the, uh, of the constituencies involved and that will be affected um, by it. You have to decide what the most effective way is to consult with that community through hearings, through requests for policy statements, through uh, physical appearances before the tribunal in a in a hearing mode, what's the best way to consult to get, the, to get the most input, and how can we emerge with the most credible result that's possible so we do our job in the best way that we can in the interest of carrying out the mandate given to us by the, uh, uh, by the government. There's a, there's a host of considerations that, that can be involved there. Uh, the, the case law is, is interesting. But I, I think, to my mind, the internal workings of the tribunal, the necessity to shape what it does by reference to its own needs and, and mission is, is essential. And I think that when Hudson does come to write that paper, he will find it a, uh, a fascinating topic to try to analyze the various situations that can arise. And I do look forward, Hudson, to reading it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jim. I'll ask uh, Anna Fraser to comment next. Thank you. I realize that um, I'm the only respondent to Hudson's paper who um, ha has not been a chair or a chairperson of a tribunal. And my comments are going to be given very much from my past experience. As Dennis mentioned, until recently, I was a member of the Ontario Municipal Board, those, uh, a, a full-time member. And before that, I... Um, is this better? Okay. Well, as I said, um, be, before I took the appointment to the board, I was uh, a practitioner. And I did primarily uh, tribunal work and then uh, pr after that appellate work into the courts. And I enjoyed it enormously. I, I'm going to be the person today, I think, urging the most caution when it comes to rules. And I'm trying very hard not to take a Luddite position. I can work a computer. My children are astonished. <coughs> but I, I'm going to be the one saying, be careful with rules. I think that rules have a very important place. I also think that they're probably inevitable. We're going to be seeing more of them. I think there's a number of reasons for this. Everybody knows the enormous backlogs before most of the tribunals these days. And before I went to the board and while I was at the board, I was party to many discussions on how to get through backlogs, how to speed up the process, how to deal with them. And a lot of the uh, discussions 
raised the possibility of rules, um, raised other possibilities such as um, alternate dispute resolution. The first time I heard that, I couldn't figure out what it means, but apparently it means things like negotiations and trying to settle things before you have to get to appeals and whatnot. Many of the uh, focus on these discussions were in reducing expenditures and speeding up the process. And when you add to that Hudson's very, very good point that you can expect greater consistency, and only an idiot would argue for greater inconsistency, rules become even more attractive at first glance. As I said, my position is going to be one of caution. You can't sacrifice fairness in the interest of speed and cost cutting. And I have to emphasize that because my most recent experience has been on a board and boards do receive their, the money from the government, you are expected, as Beth has commented, to do more with less. But we always have to remember that the administrative tribunals serve the public and the public does not exist to fit itself into the convenience of the, the boards and tribunals. My position is that there is a place for rules, but you have to figure out what kind of rules, what kind of administrative agency you're dealing with, and where within the administrative and tribunal system these rules are to be placed. First of all, we have to figure out what are administrative agencies. I realized when I read Hudson's paper that I tended to focus, because of my experience, on the appellate um, function of tribunals. And uh, I went to um, a book by uh, Casey Davis, uh, mentioned by, by Hudson, Discretionary Justice. And the term is used there a great deal. And although it wasn't defined in that book, it would seem that an administrative agency by Davis is seen to be a body created by government for the carrying out of those tasks delegated to it within the jurisdiction given it by the legislature. And these agencies may or may not have an appellate function as part or all of its mandate. And this coincides reasonably well with the um, slightly narrower definition under the Statutory Powers Procedure Act that a tribunal means one or more persons whether or not incorporated and however described upon which a statutory power of decision is conferred by or under a statute. There are an enormous variety of tribunals in Ontario. You have uh, licensing boards like the Liquor License Board. Then you have um, tribunals that deal with matters arising under a single statute and covering either one area of social activity or part of one area. And I would see in, in fitting into that the Ontario Human Rights Commission, the Pay Equity Commission, uh, Workers' uh, Compensation, and the Securities Commission. The, my, my old board, the OMB, deals with literally hundreds of statutes. The last formal count had somewhere around 120, and apparently it goes up to in excess of 200 if you think of uh, private acts like the City of Toronto Act and whatnot. The Human Rights Commission and the Pay Equity Board have broad interpretive and enforcement powers. Other pri tribunals don't. The, the Human Rights Commission, for example, has a, a staff it's to promote the, uh, the, the, the ingredients of the Human Rights Code, um, and the appellate function is uh, just a part of that, the staff that carries out investigations, it decides to recommend if the things should go to a board of inquiry and whatnot. The Ontario Municipal Board doesn't have that kind of a staff. It has a very good and competent and hardworking staff, but pretty much when matters come before the OMB, they are appeals, and if they're timely and in the right form, or even if they're not in the right form, it, it goes ahead and you have to deal with them willy-nilly. Hudson seems to me to have more in mind those tribunals with the, uh, the broader interpretation and enforcement powers. My big concern is that we have to be very careful 
of what is perceived to be the independence of tr the various tribunals. And you have to then fit out what kind of rules you want into some sort of a, a codification of tribunals. And the one that I find very useful is the one uh, set forth uh, two years ago by uh, Professor Ed Ratashny of the University of Ottawa when he did his report on administrative tribunals for the Canadian Bar Association. He focused on federal tribunals, but the analysis, I think, is an extremely good one. And he breaks them into uh, two or three sorts. And he seizes the very senior tribunals, the ones like the OMB, that have what he says are court-like powers, where you'd be ending up in court if you weren't going to be there. The others, he suggests, be called uh, boards, commissions, and agencies, and that would be more like uh, the Securities Commission, Pay Equity, and the Human Rights Commission. And I think that the role of rules is more at the beginning levels when you're dealing with the broader boards, commissions, and agencies, and less when you're getting into the more court-like ones like the OMB. I've, I have to say, of course, I think procedural rules are always extremely useful, and I know that the uh, Pay Equity Commission has rules that it developed um, in consultation with the community it serves, and the OMB recently, with, within the last uh, decade, developed rules and also did a great deal of consultation, and they're very, very useful. We, um, we have a desire for openness in our systems, and um, we should have clear statements of common hurdles that have to be met. And I liked um, Casey Davis's seven instruments that are useful in structuring discretionary power. He suggests open plans, open policy statements, open rules, open findings, open reasons, open precedents, and fair informal procedure. Now, these things make a lot of sense to me. And built into our system, we already have many of those ingredients. The matters before the Ontario Municipal Board arising out of the Planning Act, to give only one example, uh, have to, under the Planning Act, have uh, public meetings, circulation, publication, has to go to councils, there have to be appeals, and then the OMB Act says that you, uh, that has its procedural rules, you have to give decisions with reasons, the matters before the board are all to be open, uh, decisions are available th if you want them, if you're crazy enough to want them, those long, long things that we all spend time writing. Um, and the OMB reports publish the ones that are seen by the editors of that journal to be of more interest. I'm not saying it's a perfect system. It's far from a perfect system, and we all know that. However, before imposing more rules, I think we have to look to see which ones already meet the standards that we do want to uphold. Um, in Hudson's paper, he puts in some cautions that I think are very, very well taken with regard to rules. And one is the problem of rules being used by superordinates to control subordin subordinates. And I discovered in the course of this little bit of work a wonderful word. I'm so grateful to be asked to do this because I had never heard the word bureaupath before. And I think it is absolutely marvelous because we all know good, hardworking uh, public uh, servants who really are models of integrity, intelligence, ingenuity, and what, and we all, uh, so those are good, hardworking bureaucrats, but then we all have come across bureaupaths. <laughs> and rules do tend to become entrenched, and th the bureaupathic element in us flees to rules when you don't want the responsibility of making an independent decision. Also, you have to think of the time that's required when rules become outdated to implement new ones. Anybody who has waited to see legislative change knows how exhausting that can be. I think that uh, by the time a person has reached the appellate level within a board agency commission or at a tribunal, they've gone through a number of hoops. Negotiations have broken down, and they really do want to see that after they've tried everything, that matters are going to be heard on their merits. I 
also am concerned about rules in the sense that they can be seen to fetter discretion. And with the tendency nowadays to appoint uh, board members for short periods of time, you do have to worry about whether or not the tribunal will be seen to be truly independent in its making up of its mind. And something that um, came out very, very recently is the, uh, in the Law Society Gazette was a, um, an article by uh, Madam Justice Abella who said, if the appointments are for short terms and poorly remunerated with no security of tenure, this invites in the appointees either a passive commitment or creates a deterrent to courageous judgment calls. If the collegial internal tribunal environment is one of fear of non-renewal at the displeasure of partisanship, there is every chance that true decision making will be supplanted by anticipatory reticent. Decisions are and are expected to be made in accordance with impartial criteria subject to the adjudicator's conscience and view of the law. This is their role, but is it the way the public sees them performing it when the appointments lack credibility or job security? And in ending, I would say, if we bind the appellate levels of our tribunal system with rules having the effect of limiting discretion, in addition to the current insecurity of tenure, there would not be much reason for anybody with a matter before a tribunal to feel that a truly fair-minded, unfettered, and just decision would be forthcoming. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne and Beth. Well, I think that Hudson has proposed a, a very interesting challenge to move from adjudicating individual cases to policy or to, and rulemaking. This discussion is absolutely timely. Uh, Macaulay's report, Directions in 1989, advocated this move. We are currently reviewing the reform of the Statutory Powers Procedure Act, and in a report, uh, of the policy branch of the Attorney General in May of 1992. It contemplated this type of reform to the SPPA. And finally, um, tribunals in Ontario are having to deal with massive amounts of constraint. And if we are doing mass adjudication, for example, in the area of human rights or the Social Assistance Review Board, there simply is not enough resources in order to continue our present approach of individual adjudication. In responding then to Hudson's paper, I decided to focus in, based on my experience, as the chair of a new tribunal. And that tribunal has now had four years' experience in interpreting a new type of anti-discrimination legislation. The legislation says that it's an affirmative action program to redress gender discrimination. It's special in that it's no fault and it's proactive legislation. It's also important, given today's comments, that the government appears regularly before us as a party. Hudson's comments um, obviously are very seductive that rulemaking looks to be forward-looking, especially in this new type of legislation, it would tell the community what is expected of it in a new area. It, of course, then is absolutely consistent with no-fault legislation, with proactive legislation. It would also provide a consistent framework for mediating and adjudicating individual disputes. I'll confess, traditional adjudication, especially in a new area, is a bit messy. You take a few steps forward, a little bit to the left, and even occasionally make U-turns in developing your jurisprudence. At present, some agencies do engage in policy making. And the Ontario Human Rights Commission has, at least in the past, issued a number of policy statements or guidelines. For example, height and weight requirements or the rules with respect to drug testing. I think that's entirely consistent with the Commission's mandate, which is to forward human rights principles, 
to promote an understanding of and compliance with the code, and to do public information and education. It is also consistent because the Commission is mandated to enforce the statute. It is the body that has carriage of matters before a Board of Inquiry, which in Anna's terms would be the Appellate Board. I think it's entirely appropriate for the Commission to inform the community, look, this is how we, the Commission, intend to enforce the Code, govern your conduct accordingly. But such policy statements or guidelines don't bind the Boards of Inquiry or, of course, on appeal to the courts. In fact, the appellate body, the Board of Inquiry, interprets the code and applies that to the individual facts. Now, as Cudson said, this enunciation of policy or rulemaking is best done in an iterative process. That is, a policy or rule is established. There may well be a number of cases that go through, for example, the Supreme Court of Canada, and that those policies be revised and updated. But what Hudson's suggesting is that not only should the Human Rights Commission make policies or rules, but that the appellate body, that is the Board of Inquiry, the adjudicative function, should also have rulemaking power. Well, I think we should look first at the reality today. There are tribunals and there are other kinds of tribunals. And when I looked over the different kinds of legislation that exist in Ontario, I think it's very clear that some adjudicative tribunals do have rulemaking power if they wanted to use it. I think if you look at the legislation of the Ontario Energy Board or the CRTC, that they clearly have rulemaking power and, in fact, have been encouraged by the Supreme Court of Canada to do so in cases like capital cities. But then when I looked at other kinds of tribunals, like the Boards of Inquiry under Human Rights, or I looked at the Ontario Labour Relations Board, or I looked at the Pay Equity Hearings Tribunal, and generally their legislation says that we have the power to determine all questions of fact or law that arise in any matter before us. And I don't necessarily read that as a mandate to embark on rulemaking. And moreover, absent specific legislation, I'm not sure it's possible for a tribunal to establish policy or rules that bind subsequent panels. But because it's such an interesting idea, in my paper, I've explored ways that various tribunals have tried to approach the problem. For example, the OLRB has sat in expanded panels. We've tried grouping cases together to try and give a decision which would then at least give guidance to subsequent, uh, subsequent disputes. WCAT has embarked on a leading case strategy, taking one case out, adjudicating on it, and hoping that the others will follow behind. And the Labour Board issues practice notes, which are a way to advise the community of how they generally type, intend to proceed on specific issues. So therefore, I say that if we are going to embark in rulemaking, we probably need that reform under the SPPA. It's a great idea. I've just got a few caveats. The first thing is that you know, we haven't been setting policy, and I think that governments may be very nervous about us engaging in rulemaking or policy-making statements, especially, as I say, when governments appear before us as parties with very clear positions as to how it should be interpreted. In some cases, when you look at a new piece of legislation or recent amendments, it's not immediately clear what rules or policies should be issued. I've seen in our statute that the, 
that it's silent on a number of key issues. You know, it might have been because of oversight, but when I look over the legislative debates, I think that they, quite frankly, ducked major issues. For example, the one we've been faced with is who's the employer? And it's clear that they duck that. Now, before we were to engage in rulemaking or policy setting, I think it would be a wise tribunal that would actually deal with that issue on a fact-based situation, in fact, in a variety of settings, before it waded in and so boldly filled that gap. You know, under rulemaking, when you first look at an issue, many times the answers or the policies aren't all that certain. Or let me be frank, what was initially certain isn't quite so simple after you look at that issue in a variety of settings. And I think it's very helpful to examine a new issue in different factual contexts. There's an awful onus on you if you have to get it right the first time. Moreover, I think that in areas like anti-discrimination, society's understanding of these issues is changing so rapidly that early policy making could freeze or retard the evolution. And I'd like you to think of our approach to anti-racism in light of the events of the past spring in Toronto. Now Hudson says, we'll make better decisions and they'll be more legitimate. But you know, it's a real challenge to think, how will we, how will we give effective notice to the affected parties? The very people that we want to hear from in anti-discrimination statutes don't read the Gazette. It's not on my reading list, nor the Globe and Mail. And when we ask people to participate, you know, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of energy to do effective research, to make informed submissions. And the only means we have now is for one or two or three tribunals under the Intervenor Funding Act which is not of general application and doesn't apply to any of the anti-discrimination tribunals. I look over and see Ted Weatherall here and I think that his board is a place where rulemaking has been very interesting and in fact quite effective. At the Canada Labour Relations Board and also at the BC Industrial Relations Council, I think they both have statutory authority to make policy statements which bind subsequent panels of the tribunal. And it's generally done by sitting as a whole board or tribunal. And the Canada Board has used this power in two situations. First of all, where the board intends to depart from its established jurisprudence. For example, it's used it when it's going to use a new way of defining a bargaining unit. And it has also used this power <coughs> to resolve diverging jurisprudence of the board to try and establish a more unified approach on an issue. And in doing so, it has sought broader participation by the uh, labor relations community in these particular cases. So in conclusion, I think that rulemaking or policy making power is in fact the way of the future, especially as we face increased caseloads with less resources to manage them. I think an, an amendment to the Statutory Powers Procedure Act would be a very useful tool in order to deal with these issues but it isn't a panacea. It, I don't think, works for new tribunals dealing initially with points of law. And I think that there still is room for step-by-step -step adjudication to develop the jurisprudence slowly 
with the room to refine, adapt, and even modify its policy. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. That was uh, very interesting. I've noticed that uh, Hudson's been feverishly making notes during the course of the three uh, commentaries so that what will the format until the end of uh, the program, which ends at 10.30, is that I'll ask Hudson to give us a five-minute response and then open it to the floor for questions. Well, this really will be a, a five-minute response because uh, I found the comments, both uh, the written versions that you have in front of you and what we've heard uh, uh, today, extremely helpful uh, to the whole process of thinking through uh, choice in decision-making and particularly uh, with respect to, uh, to rulemaking. Um, I take Anna's point, uh, looked at from the perspective of the OMB, as really a, a very valid one, and it's a, it's a, well, a concern that indeed was uh, reflected as well in, in Beth's remarks, that to, 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 to conceive of the rulemaking as applying in the appellate uh, 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 forum is much more difficult and, and much more problematic. So I, I think that's a very helpful, uh, helpful notion. I was struck by her reference to my old uh, mentor at Chicago, Casey Davis, and structuring and how much she likes about what he was proposing. And indeed, I think that's very interesting to see how she was seeing within the OMB how much uh, structuring was in fact going on. I thought what I found particularly useful about the comments from um, uh, Anna and uh, from Jim was the, the emphasis on the flexibility that we do have. I found that, that Jim, when he was talking about the relationship between rulemaking and adjudication, mentioned, for example, speeches by the chairman. And, and it, you realize that now this whole thing is on a, on a sliding scale. It's on a spectrum. That it's not a matter of rigid regulations and rules here and adjudication here. That, in fact, it's, it's on a sliding scale and in which it's going to be, it's going to be worked out on a, on a continuing basis. And in that regard, for example, I thought Beth's reference to the various techniques, highly innovative, highly interesting techniques, sort of very reason why one likes to participate in, in conferences like that, because you can pontificate as an academic on the general, but what's always fascinating to find out what's really happening out there. And what's really happening out there is very exciting. Her, her, her reference to notions of grouping cases, of expanding panels to deal with certain matters, of use of practice notices, the use of a leading case strategy, this, these all being, being used in various things are just the sort of things that seem to me to be very important that, that, that we try and structure, confine, and, and uh, uh, our discretion through these various uh, techniques. So I find that uh, extremely helpful. I, I, the, the final closing caveats of Beth were really just fascinating to me because I think there is a very real problem with legitimacy, and I think we've got to think that through. And as I say, I found in the Cornish report that wasn't thought through, although I, I again, did like uh, Lepofsky's uh, comment on that. I loved her reference to, to the failure to define uh, the employer, which seemed to me to be a classic example of that lovely term, purposeful ambiguity. That is, that, that sometimes we denounce politicians for being ambiguous and don't realize that that's the business they're in, is to be purposefully <laughs> ambiguous. I thought that's, and I thought your illustration is just, uh, just absolutely, absolutely wrong. And, and I thoroughly agree uh, with this notion that you need to use adjudication, especially at the outset, that you mustn't rush into rigid rules, that you must go through a, through a process. But, uh, but I still, and I also agree the problem of participation. Again, as I listed the reasons for caution in Canada in rulemaking, I said we don't have established approaches to participation in rulemaking. And, and that does understandably lead to some, uh, to some, uh, some, some hes hesitation about it. So I, I found the, uh, the comments uh, uh, extremely helpful. And I think we are beginning to build up now in Canadian administrative law a, a, a better understanding for this, the notion of, uh, of choice. And, uh, and uh, although I uh, am, am distinctly intimidated, by uh, Jim Bailey's uh, call for my, my to write a modest little piece <laughs> called Guidelines for Chairpersons of Administrative Tribunals. I'll, I'll even try to rise to that eventually. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Hatsi. Now, we very much would like to, um, we've allotted, we have 15 minutes, 20 minutes before the end of the program, and would very much encourage questions from the floor. Yes.
Well, I, I must say I found the second half of your, your comments when you, you made it a question quite fascinating because it met my initial concern. That you, you initially drew, it seemed to me, a, a very bright line between a procedural rule and substantively dealing with a problem. And I think we all know that how you approach a problem it has a considerable influence on the substantive results that you, you end up with. And that's why I thought it was interesting when you, when you moved uh, on to the question of the, uh, the charter challenges, that you said it wasn't a question of simply announcing we have the authority to deal with charter questions. It was a much more interesting and linking question between substance and procedure in which you said how will we approach charter, charter uh, question, if a charter question comes up before us. And that I think is a, is a very interesting question because indeed it seems to me that in the discussion we had yesterday when we listed uh, the various factors that uh, the trilogy and the subsequent cases um, have indicated that in fact in some ways that would be it seemed to me a very effective proactive reaction by a tribunal to say the, this is the way that we can deal with a charter question in a manner which the courts have signaled to us is, a, is, is an effective manner which will, which will meet their concerns. So, such as, for example, building up the record that you want to establish uh, in order to show the, tr the, uh, the court that in looking at the charter question, the tribunal was drawing on its strength uh, of contextual a circumstance rather than its weakness of isolated uh, uh, interpretation of law. In other words, that it was really doing a job that, 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 that meant that you should be uh, uh, letting the tribunal do it. So I find it a very, a very interesting idea and one that didn't come up in yesterday's discussion and I think one that we should be thinking about uh, today. It's a very useful link between uh, yesterday and, and today. But if I just could take one, one second, I think one of the most striking changes in uh, tribunal practice that, that, that I've seen is that 20 years ago, when I came up as a young kid from, from the American school waving discretionary justice from Casey Davis, A, I was regarded as quite uh, certifiable. I mean, that was just absolute craziness. And secondly, everybody denied. It was a complete process of denial. Oh, we just adjudicate. We have no guidelines. We have no policies. And indeed, you remember the scandal of the Workers' Compensation Board uh, now, t now 15 years ago, in which manuals were kept uh, in the bottom drawers of adjudicators, and in which there was this facade and pretense. We don't have any, make any guidelines. We don't make any policies. We don't have any manual. We, we just decide individual cases on the individual merits. Well, I think we've progressed, and I find it extremely uh, uh, desirable that we've progressed from denial to at least recognition of what, what we do. I think the next stage is the one that, that, that I'm trying to propose now, is that we actually b become even more self-conscious and self-consciously aware of what we're doing and, and move more to rulemaking away from good. But guidelines that are publicly available are a very significant step forward from what we had before, which was secret guidelines. Any other questions? Yes.
stripes, Nana, would you? Um, perhaps you could just fill out your question a little bit more. Right. Well, actually, the, um, the policy statements under Section 3 are something that have always intrigued me and, you know, practitioners before the board as well as board members, because uh, what happens when you get those policy statements is that uh, the board then makes recommendations and, uh, you know, the recommendations to the minister on those particular policies. So it's, it kind of circles in on itself. And um, I have a special concerns about those sections, that section now and those policy statements since the OMB was transferred out of the Attorney General's um, bailiwick and is now within the Ministry of Municipal Affairs. Municipal Affairs appears before the, uh, the board um, as a party. It's uh, that minister that makes those policy statements and uh, this has led to widespread perceptions uh, among the practicing bar that um, the OMB is you know kind of shaky in the perception of its independence so um, you know what you've opened up is really quite a big question and it's one that makes me especially uncomfortable with the way things are going well I, I think that just for the sake of uh, of the tape let me let me repeat the the, the question the, the question was to what extent do the, the provision for example in the planning act with respect to policies, directions that the government can give to the OMB, uh, which requires the, the uh, agency to have regard to uh, the government policies, resolve the legitimacy question, which uh, I raised a moment ago. Uh, I think, uh, first of all, I think it is, it is responsive, and I think so. I think it's an excellent, uh, an excellent point that's, uh, that's, uh, that's made. Um, I think my concern is a, a pragmatic and a, and a very real one. Um, Governments tend to want to wait in the in, uh, lay back and and wait to see how things turn out, and as a result, um, the 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 problem is that if you don't have the means of influencing the the need to issue uh, some more general uh, policy statement, there's a there's a danger that the government won't exercise this power and, th and that the problem won't won't be resolved. So. Uh, I see that, for example, particularly at the at the federal level, where the government, on the one hand, is demanding the right to have policy control over the administrative agencies, and then when challenged to issue policy statements, saying, "Well, we're not quite ready yet," <laughs> and 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 so that you really are denying the legitimacy of the agency to make policy, but not coming through and issuing the policy uh, your, uh, yourself. So I see it as a as a as an important tool in the legitimacy uh, concern, but I don't see it as a complete answer. I, I really do think that there is need to initiate. In fact, I, again, let me just, just take it one stage further. One of the striking things, again, in the United States is the notion that you can apply to an agency for a rulemaking proceeding and that the agency has to respond. Now, I can say no. But it means that the initiative for rulemaking is 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 much more um, uh, self-starting, and 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 if we were to see a rulemaking power uh, put into the Statute of Powers Procedure Act, I, for example, would be very concerned that it not be a power to be exercised solely uh, at the discretion of the agency. I think that parties coming before agencies who are faced with a, a series of problems which they think could be better resolved through rulemaking should have uh, the legal authority to seek to initiate a rulemaking procedure and not simply have to wait until the agency itself said about it. Now, that's a, a little bit more uh, controversial and it's pushing the rulemaking proceeding through a little bit further, but uh, I certainly hope that, uh, that uh, when th further thought is given to amending the Statutory Powers Procedure Act 
to allow uh, agencies to make rules that that uh, not be uh, be lost sight of. Yes, Michael. Yes, I was uh, interested in uh, Jim Bailey's uh, comment uh, a little earlier on the uh, <coughs> use of the news media, particularly with the uh, Securities Commission, because I'd be interested in the views of the panel on how the news media should interface with tribunal. Uh, the reason I say that, uh, going back to, uh, uh, to my uh, being a member and former chairman of the Ontario Environmental Assessment Board, um, that's a tribunal that often gets involved in hearings, which uh, some of you probably realized uh, last year. So in fact, it has just uh, recently wrapped up one hearing, the Timber Management Class EA hearing, uh, which I myself opened on May 10th, 1988. <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask uh, Jim, as a former chair, to uh, respond first, if I could. The 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 question that's a, it's a, it's a it's a very good question is is uh, from Michael Jeffrey is the uh, use of the media in the in the interaction between the between the tribunal and the uh, and the uh, public as to uh, as, and he gave the example of a major environmental hearing with 500 people attending on day one and then the audience tapering off. And is it appropriate for the tribunal to give news, news conferences and so on to help keep the public informed? My own philosophy, and I, well, let me back up a second. This is a, an increasingly difficult area because, because more and more legal counsel in this country on a major matter are following the, the standard that, that is set south of the border, which is that they see themselves as, as 50 to 75 percent there to win the case before the tribunal. But another, you know, the, the balancing factor, 25 to 50 percent, out to win the case before the media. And they don't hesitate to make, to make comments, statements, to be quoted, to, uh, to orchestrate campaigns so that their client is successful, they hope, both in the, in the eyes of the media and in the eyes of the tribunal, but at least in the eyes of the media, and that they can then turn around and criticize this terrible decision afterwards and have some public sympathy. And, and the tribunal is in a very difficult position reacting to that sort of orchestrated onslaught, which is part of the society we live in. My own philosophy, and I'm I just one person to be fascinated with what others have to say, my own philosophy is that, is that the, in the context of a rulemaking procedure or a policy guideline formulating procedure, the tribunal can wade in there and issue its own news releases and have its own news conferences. It's always got to bear in mind that it's the decision maker shouldn't, shouldn't predict the decision before the decision is made, but it, before the decision is made on, an, on a rule making or a policy making, it can comment, in my judgment, react, provoke, have public discussions, media releases and so on. After it's made, it can defend the decision, uh, again in public fora. The really difficult question is where you have an adjudicative decision with wide impact. Not, you know, that uh, it's, it's an adjudicative decision that involves party A, 
was going to have an impact for, on a lot of other parties. Are you defenseless? Must your hands be tied because it is an adjudicative process and you're judge-like in this, in this situation? I'm, I'm of the old school. I'm afraid I think your hands are tied. I think that the um, tribunal can't wade into a public battle either before the event or after the event on an adjudicative matter because I think that its, um, its role is that of a judge. But, I, but I'd be very interested in the comments of others on that. I got two kinds of responses, first of all at a professional level and then dealing with the media. Um, I think it's entirely appropriate for chair of tribunal to go to the lawyers uh, subsection and essentially give updates as to where we've been, where we're going and why. Um, I've heard you do that when you explained the scoping decision uh, which was one of, it was the first I think that I have seen. and. That was, I think, well received as saying, okay, so this is what it's about and this is where we're going. I also think it's really helpful to uh, meet regularly, at least on an annual basis with the users, to try and get feedback with respect to procedure. Not about substantive decisions, but some things just aren't working. Or perhaps there are ways of doing things better. And I think that that formalizing that form of dialogue um, and doing it other than in Toronto, that is in Ottawa and Sudbury and Sarnia, et cetera, it is very helpful. And I have always been impressed by the quality of the feedback and it's made a real difference. In terms of decision release, I uh, agree with Jim on this. What uh, we do in terms of decisions, which sometimes are lengthy and sometimes are complex um, is that we summarize the decision. Our tribunal council summarizes the decision for the press and answers questions, not to try and defend it, but trying to help them understand it and makes herself very available that when the press calls to say, you know, have I got it right, that it's, uh, it's useful at that point to, to try and set out. Um, I think being accessible in that way is, is an important part of communicating the message to the users, and I think that that's within the bounds, but not defending it. Thank you, Beth. Well, uh, time's up. I think on behalf of all of us, I'm, there are a few more questions, but the dictates of the schedule require we draw it to a close. I mean, it's been simply first rate. I think everybody would agree. This has been a, just an excellent presentation by Hudson and the commentators, and we're all very deeply appreciated for the time that they put into it. Thank you very much.